Tonight's disciple that we're going to look at is Thomas. And if you have your Bibles, I ask you to turn to John chapter 20. If not, grab one in front of you. And of course, Thomas is known for his doubting. But there's one thing that in this book that we're working through, uh, looking at the disciples, we're going to see a lot of characteristic issues. And what we have to realize is you and me, we have different characteristic issues. We're all different. We all have different personalities. We all have different likes, different wants. And with all these things which are different in our lives, can those things still be used for the glory and the honor of God? And the, these three points that we're going to look at tonight is going to deal with some of those issues. John chapter 20, verse 24 and 25. Verse 24, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into the side, I will never believe. Now this is one of the things in which Thomas is known for. The time and when he started doubting about Jesus. But tradition says that Thomas became a great missionary in the country of India and where he established a church and that did mighty works for the kingdom of God. But he died a martyr's death. And the funny thing is, is he fell fatal to a wound of a spear piercing his side. This is the same man, if it's so ironic, that this is the same man who demonstrated his trust and, and he wanted to thrust his hands into the pierced side of Jesus. That he died the same way. And that is how history talks about with Thomas is how he died by this spear. But one of the things we're going to look at tonight, the first principle, is it possible to be a pessimistic personality, yet a sincere follower of Jesus Christ? Is this even possible? And when we look at that thing and we think about that, many times we want to say, no way, it's not possible. And as we've already looked at several of the different disciples, you've seen some of that personality in those other disciples in which we looked at. And tonight, we're going to see that in Thomas. It's formed by a basic pattern from birth in different individuals. Some of these traits are also developed in their environment. But whether the source is of its importance is to understand that the Holy Spirit wants to transform us into the image of Christ. We say, where did, does that type of personality start? And it, some people say it starts from birth. It was the way they were born. Some people say it was their environment. Some people say the way they were raised. But one of the things we noticed in John chapter 11, he asserted his willingness to die for the Lord before any of the other disciples. In John chapter 11, verse 16, Thomas was one of the first disciples said that he would be willing to die for Jesus. In spite of his pessimistic approach to life, Thomas brings us to a message of hope. And the sad thing is, is there's a lot of people sitting in our pews today that deal with this and as a personality. Though we will never change the basic patterns which we were born with. We can change the way we respond to our circumstances in life. You see, Thomas couldn't change the way he was. He couldn't change the way he looked at life. But he started realizing as he became older and more mature, he could change how he responded to circumstances. And we can learn to reflect 
the fruits of the Holy Spirit. You see, from the moment that Thomas started following Jesus to the moment Thomas became a great missionary for Christ, you can see the transformation inside of him changing to him starting to bear the fruits of the Spirit. Our second principle that we're going to look at, is it possible to be a very logical and rational thinker yet be spiritually confused? Many times that can happen to a lot of people in our churches with this personality trait. Though Thomas could function in a very logical and rational way, he didn't understand who Jesus really was. He knew what he saw and he could try to add up what was going on. But nowhere along the way did Thomas really understand who Jesus really was. Because if you say, well, he understood, then why would he say at the end, after Jesus had already died that death on the cross, he come back before the disciples, and he's there, and the disciples, his friends, the people he loves, the people he spent time with, telling him what happened, and he goes, I'll never believe unless I put my hands in those holes. You see, he could see it, but he could never truly understand who Jesus really was. It personally believes that Thomas began this experience, spiritual discernment, the day that he questioned Jesus about the way to the Father. In John chapter 14, verse 5 When you see him and Jesus having this conversation about the Father and how to get to the Father, you can start noticing things changing in Thomas's life. He's asking questions and he's trying to use his rational way of thinking to answer the questions that's in his mind and in his heart. But he wasn't fully to the point of adding two plus two with this situation. At the moment the Holy Spirit revealed to him who Jesus really was, spiritual truth and spiritual discernment started taking place in him. Though he still entered a period of doubt, continued to battle with his pessimistic tendencies, Thomas had become a new creation in Christ. Thomas was changing even though he still had these traits, these flaws. I have a question I want to ask you and myself. What is your flaws? What are the things in your personality that causes you to struggle with your relationship with God? What causes you to fully just jump off into His arms and expect Him to catch you? What is it that causes you to come to that edge and you're getting ready to jump, but you never leave the edge. You see, Thomas had come to the edge multiple times and he was ready to jump, but he was, had that personality that he wasn't sure. He had so many questions, had so many doubts, and he was struggling with so much of it. He was like, yeah, I see but, yeah, I was there, but. And that but always kept him from jumping off the edge into the arms of Christ to fully be that man God wanted him to be. Could you imagine the experience Thomas would have had if while Jesus was still on earth, when he started following Christ, if he would have fully trusted pushed away his doubt, pushed away his personality, and just jumped off and followed Christ, the experiences and the blessings he would have had, they would have been numerous. We want to say that for Thomas. Now let's think about ourselves. How many blessings would you have, or I have, if every day we'd wake up and we'd jump off the edge? And follow Christ with everything we have. But many times our personality, whatever it is, yours is different than mine and mine's different than yours. But whatever that little niche is 
that you have that causes you from jumping off the edge and being what Christ wants you to be, if we were able to push it to the side, Thomas wasn't until the end. But guess what? He finally got it to the side and he finally got to experience the blessings that God was wanting to give him the whole time that he was missing out on. Our third principle that we're going to look at Is it possible for a true believer to experience a crisis of faith that creates a complete state of doubt? That statement says a lot. If you really look at those sentences. Thomas was not with the other apostles when Jesus made His first appearance after the resurrection. Thomas wasn't there. And many people say, well, why was he not there? Why was he not in the room? And some people wonder and think about his personality and think about all this that was going on, how Thomas's mental makeup was. And some people have perceived, I guess is the best way to put it, perhaps he was so angry and wondered and was disillusioned that he simply went off by himself, to regain perspective. That he had just seen all this that had happened. He realized all the persecution that was coming toward the disciples. How the people were hunting these disciples and whom had followed Christ. He had realized the man that he had started putting trust in. He had started putting faith in. He was just about getting there. And now all of a sudden he's gone. He's dead. He's, they can't even find his body. Can you imagine a person with a personality like Thomas? He was doubting. He was pessimistic. He had all these issues in his mind and in his heart. And he was struggling with it. He was never truly at peace with it. Nowhere along the journey of Jesus' ministry. And now he was standing there face to face. I imagine oh boy had to get away. I imagine he had to go out somewhere. Had to pick up a few rocks and skip them across the lake. And have a little conversation with himself. Might even had learned through those experiences of walking with Jesus how to pray. I believe he did. And I believe he probably was praying. It would make sense that he would try to revert to his old ways of doing things, trying to cope at a rational level trying to rationalize all this that had happened, Thomas immediately put up his mental and emotional guard. He started, oh, whoa, whoa, what's going on? And then when he comes back into the room, the disciples say, what had just happened? And Thomas puts up his guard. He goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't know about all that. He would not risk reopening the wounds. The the risk and where he had gotten to, to that edge, and he had gotten to the point that he was ready to jump off and fully trust God with everything. He wasn't willing to open up those wounds. He would not trust the report that his fellow disciples had given him. But you see, there's a good part to this story about Thomas' life. And the funny thing is, the way Thomas' life and the Scriptures end, it could happen to you and me. Seven days later, Jesus once again appeared, calming the fear of the disciples. But He didn't just calm the fear of the disciples when He reappeared. He turned to the face of Thomas. Do you notice that in that passage when it talks about that He came back He didn't turn to the face of the other disciples. He turned straight to Thomas. Knowing the situation in which was going on with Thomas. He knew what Thomas was struggling with. He knew the heart of Thomas. And he invited his doubting disciple to put his fingers in his hands and to the wounds that he still visibly could see. He invited Thomas So Thomas, put your hand here and let's do away with the doubt once and for all. 
What's it going to take for you to put your hands in those holes and do away with your doubt once and for all? Thomas did. It's time for you and me to do it too. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the...